Hello and welcome. I'm Adele Gautier from Breast Cancer Foundation NZ. Tonight we're talking about what you need to know when you're newly diagnosed with breast cancer. Before we get started, some housekeeping. If you have any technical issues, there should be a phone number in the chat box at the bottom left of your screen and a passcode that you'll need to use. Or you can type details of your problem into that chat box and one of our support people will help you. You can use the chat box during the webinar to ask questions, which hopefully we'll get to later. And you can also chat to other people who are attending the webinar. Don't worry if you miss out on information while you're chatting. The webinar will be on our website in a few days' time and you can watch it again. Tonight we have three panellists who are going to share with you. Mary was diagnosed with breast cancer last year at age 52. <coughs> Elisa Taylor is a breast surgeon and Janice Wood is a breast care nurse. First we're going to hear from Mary. Mary, thank you so much for being here tonight and for being willing to share what's gone on in your life since that shocking day when you were told you had breast cancer. Um, I think we'll just let you go ahead and, and tell that story. Okay, thank you. Well, on the evening of the 21st of December 2015, after my shower, I caught sight of myself in the mirror and noticed something looked different. I then felt my breast and discovered the lump. I previously had a couple of small cysts and also a fibrous lump in my right breast, but I never thought it would be cancer, but then who does? I saw my GP on Christmas Eve and then had to wait to see someone for a mammogram, which happened on the 5th of January, which was a pretty scary time. I followed this with a needle biopsy, which was done on the 7th. On the morning of the 12th, I received a phone call from my GP asking me to come to the surgery straight away. My heart sank as I realised it wasn't going to be good news. Although it was still a huge shock, my GP told me I had stage 2 breast cancer and would probably need a mastectomy of my left breast. It was hard to take in and all I could do was cry. She made an appointment for me to see the breast surgeon, which was on the 14th of January. Following my doctor's appointment, I went to work. I needed some space to get my head around everything, but stopped halfway to have a good cry. My husband was fabulous. He um, was the one that told everybody and in fact told my parents in the UK, which wasn't the good, best thing to be doing, I'm sure, but he did it, which was great. My daughter didn't want to talk to anyone about it, and uh, she actually changed her uni plans to stay at home. Um, she also had a holiday booked with friends, which she wanted to cancel, but we convinced her to continue going because we thought it would be good for her. Peter told all of our friends, which at least meant I didn't have to, and once they all knew, it was much easier for me. Everyone, though, reacts differently. Sorry, I didn't want to tell anyone. We saw my breast surgeon on the 14th of, August, of January and I was diagnosed with stage 2 grade 3 invasive ductal breast cancer. And following marker tests, this was confirmed that it was HER2 positive and would require chemotherapy, the removal of my left breast plus 15 lymph nodes followed by radiotherapy. The surgeon made me an appointment to see my oncologist and we discovered the lump was 4.5 centimetres in size can't believe I hadn't noticed it before. Amazing. My oncologist decided on seven cycles of chemotherapy, which was going to be done neoadjuvant. So we had a plan, which felt great. Although a little scary to be doing chemo before surgery, at this time appointments were becoming, coming through thick and fast. I had a CT scan, a bone scan, etc. I started my first cycle of chemotherapy on the 3rd of February and that was four cycles of Herceptin, Pertuzumab and Docetaxel. These were followed by three cycles of FEC. I'm not going to try to pronounce any of those, I'm afraid. One of these is known as 5-FU and yes, I did feel it like it was FU cancer. <laughs> <laughs> Until Grastim injections to boost my red white cell count. I had my surgery on the 24th of January and my left breast was removed plus a uh, total of 15 lymph nodes. At the time of surgery, I was told that I had no residual cancer cells, which was great. It was all just yucky dead tissue. And this was confirmed following a biopsy of the tissue and the lymph nodes. I followed that with um, 13 cycles of septin, which I started on the 8th of July. And then on the 4th of August, I had the first of 15 radiotherapy treatments. 
I hadn't even taken paracetamol, paracetamol for a very long time, so it's hard to suddenly be taking so many drugs. I have seen a homeopath for some time, and I needed her to support me through my journey. So I saw her throughout, and I continued to see her. And she has also doubled as my counsellor, something that I really did need. I wasn't scared. I was bloody terrified. I really didn't know what to expect. I was worried about the side effects of the chemo and how I would feel minus one breast. Control was my biggest thing. I had my hair cut short. Pre-treatment and I went wig shopping with a friend. We made a date of it. As soon as my hair started to fall out, I had my head shaved. My daughter, Sarah, came with me and took photographs. I fitted my chemo treatments around work, so I arranged to have all the infusions on the day that I wanted, which really worked well for me. When I went for my pre-chemo treatment, I was given a script for what seemed like a huge list of drugs. I found this quite difficult, but I knew I couldn't beat the cancer or cope with any side effects of the chemo without them. My husband took control of the drugs that I had to take pre and post chemo. I could have done it myself, but it was about him doing something for me and being in control of something because he was really struggling with it all. We familiarised ourselves with all the drugs and Peter labelled them so that he understood which drug needed to be taken and when. My biggest concern was nausea and it was Peter's too. When he asked the oncologist how bad was it going to be, he just said, things have come a long way, Peter, and you've probably been watching far too many movies, such as The Bucket List. Yes, there are side effects, but these can be managed incredibly well, and although the slightest thing normally upsets my stomach, I only vomited once. At the time, Peter wanted me to take something to stop the nausea, but I knew I needed to throw up, and once I had, I felt great and wanted a cup of tea. <laughs> the reflux was the one thing that was totally unexpected. My family had gone out and um, came home to find me rolling around the floor, clutching my chest, and they obviously assumed that I was having a heart attack. <laughs> the awful thing was is I was trying desperately hard not to laugh because they were panicking so much but uh, and also couldn't get the words out to say, I'm actually all right, it was just a pain. I'm, you know. My husband rang the oncologist and said, who said that I just needed to take the reflux drug. So once we got onto that, it was really good. But listen there, listen to the professionals. <laughs> I didn't need to take the anti-nausea drugs other than for the couple of days that I had the just post-chemo um, and I never needed the sleeping tablets or the powerful painkillers so I felt very lucky. I did experience the awful taste in my mouth which was very similar to blood and of course it may affected how everything tasted. My parents came over for six weeks to help Peter in those first few weeks. Cooking lessons were a necessity I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, besides it's not the telling. It's a difficult part throughout the whole thing. It was the look on people's faces when they hear that dreadful word, cancer, and yes, it is with a capital C. Did they think they would become infected? Everyone said you will be fine. At first, I wondered if it was for them or me to feel better. I was lucky. I never felt I had any negative setbacks or problems. As I said, I only vomited once. All the medical professionals I dealt with were fabulous. I've managed to continue going to work and the gym, although I often came home and fell asleep in the chair. If I needed to rest, I did, and I have learned to listen to my body. I have a fabulous gym instructor, Lisa. She lost her mother from cancer at the same time as I was diagnosed, and she helped me accept that my body needed to rest and recover. However, that didn't always mean sitting on my bum. Around, we adapted everything around how I was feeling and what I was dealing with at the time. As a result, Lisa and I have not surprisingly become very close and I feel we've helped each other. People will offer to help and these are not empty words. Please take them up on it. Have a list ready. Um, anything to make dealing with what you're going through easier. You know, It's not about being weak. It's about putting yourself first and of course your family. And yes, there will be people who run for the hills. Don't take it personally. It's their problem, not yours. I, how I dealt with it, I took a person with all my, all my appointments with me. If I missed something, they could pick up on it. Um, they took notes for me so that I could listen to what was being said, although sometimes I admit I didn't hear it. Make a note of the questions you want to ask and don't be afraid to ask them. Whatever it is, it's never done. It's your body and your journey. If you don't understand something, ask again. 
make sure you are heard not just by the professionals but by yourself and family members. Support people. You know what is best for you. My support network are my friends and family and as I said, my homeopath doubled as counsellor. One of the things I did do when I was dealing with this whole thing was I kept a journal and I created a private Facebook group. It was my way of keeping everyone informed and I learned early on that it's hard replying to everyone's messages and it was also easy to keep my family in the loop. I had my first mammogram since treatment on the 15th of March, just sitting waiting for everything back and yes, I cried. I had my last hair set in treatment on the 22nd of March and I've just recently had my portacat removed. 16 months almost to the day of finding the lump. I now feel great and back to normal and I'm ready to start new challenges and enjoy time with family and friends. I feel stronger mentally and it has made me appreciate what I have. I hate confrontation and I am a real people pleaser but I try to bring things now to please myself as well. I think I'll leave it there now and um, hopefully people if they want to ask questions they can do so. Okay, thank you so much Mary, we're really uh, grateful to you for sharing that with us. Now we're going to hear from Elisa Taylor. Elisa is a breast surgeon, she's head of the breast surgery unit at Auckland Hospital and also works in private practice and she's actually often the person who's giving patients the, the bad news confirming a diagnosis of breast cancer. Anita, can you tell us about the treatments and why someone might or might not end up having each one? Absolutely. Um, I think one of the things that's always very clear to me is that after you hear the word cancer, it's often very, very hard to hear anything beyond that. And I would absolutely agree with Mary in, in saying that it's a great idea to bring people with you for support for those appointments as a second, and as a second pair of ears. And don't hesitate if you're not clear on anything to ask questions or say you need time or another appointment. Because after you've had a breast cancer diagnosis, there's a lot of different things to consider. Um, you need to think about surgery. What are the options? What sort of things might influence your decision around those options? And then after your surgery, there's all the pathology, the results under the microscope and, and figuring out what that all means. And that leads into whether or not you're going to need any extra treatments, radiation, chemotherapy, other kinds of drug treatments. One of the things you'll find is that there's suddenly a whole lot of medical people involved in your life. Um, your hospital team will include your surgeon, radiologist, medical and radiation oncologist and your breast care nurse who I can't emphasise highly enough um, as a really key person in the journey and an excellent contact person. When I first meet women and, and sit down and, and, and we're talking about that initial diagnosis of a cancer, it's really, really challenging because everyone wants to know where to from here, what does this mean? Um, and often the first next step is surgery. And the surgery is designed to do two things. It's designed to get rid of the cancer but it's also designed to provide more information around prognosis or outlook and help us answer those questions about whether or not you're going to need any extra treatment. And so it's really difficult to answer those questions as accurately as possible until after the surgery. So I always say focusing on, on the surgery first in terms of deciding what treatment is for you unless you're having one of the newer approaches with the chemotherapy first. When I talk about what surgical options there are, I split it into two groups because really what we're interested in is doing something to the cancer in the breast and also doing something to the lymph nodes to get more information because whether or not there's any cancer cells in the lymph nodes is one of the most important things in terms of figuring out what the risk is long term. And generally speaking these days, unless there's a reason not to do, we do something called a, a sentinel lymph node biopsy to look at the lymph nodes. When we're talking about what we can do for the breast, we've got two main options, breast conservation or lumpectomy or mastectomies, removing the whole breast and that can be done with or without a reconstruction. So the central node biopsy procedure is basically a targeted approach to find out information about whether or not there are cancer cells in the lymph nodes by doing the least surgery possible. The central lymph node is like the guardian lymph node. It's the first lymph node to which the cancer cells will spread to. And if we can target that one or two lymph, those one or two lymph nodes 
and have a look at them during the operation and find out if there's any cancer cells in, in them, we can get a lot of extra information. If the sentinel node's negative, then we can be very comfortable that there's highly unlikely to be any disease in the remainder of the lymph nodes and we don't need to do any further surgery. If there are cancer cells in those lymph nodes, we then go on during the same operation to remove further lymph nodes in what we call a, an axillary node dissection. And essentially, unless we know before the surgery that there's cancer cells or disease in the lymph nodes, we would routinely look at doing a central node biopsy for, for the, um, the preferred, preferred operation. When we're talking about breast conservation, there's lots of different names. It can get pretty confusing. But essentially, a lumpectomy, a wide local excision, or breast conserving surgery are all different names for the same thing. And what that is, is taking the cancer out with a cuff of normal tissue around it. Um, it's really important to follow with radiotherapy. Well, there's lots of really good studies comparing the safety of a partial mastectomy with mastectomies for the treatment of cancer. And we know that for most women, if you leave out the radiotherapy, the chances of things coming back in the breast, what we call recurrent, is too high. So if you're thinking about a partial mastectomy, it essentially goes hand in hand with radiotherapy. Um, if it's an option for women, um, we, prefer to, we prefer to do breast conservation where we can. And the reason we do it is we want to treat the cancer and we want to treat the cancer properly because obviously that's the most important thing. But if we can do that and leave a woman with as good a looking breast as we can, then surely that's got to be a good thing. There are some women where we can't do that. And sometimes the cancer relative to the size of a woman's breast is just too big. So what we need to remove is going to be too much of the breast and what we leave behind is not going to look any good. Some women, there's more than one spot in the breast of cancer and you obviously can't remove all of that by just removing part of the breast. That's what we call multifocal cancer. There are some women, even if we say, look, this is a safe option for treating your cancer, they're just really scared. And they know that their concern about local recurrence or things coming back and any remaining tissue is going to be too high. And so they, they choose to have a mastectomy. Um, and then sometimes the radiotherapy plays into it, particularly in a country like New Zealand where radiotherapy is not available in every city, in every town. And so some women just can't face the, the thought of travelling to radiotherapy and, and choose not to have a, a partial mastectomy on this basis. And some women are unlucky enough that they've had a partial mastectomy in radiotherapy previously and develop a further area of cancer and we can't do the same thing twice. Um, we talked a little bit about how, how safe it is and I think it's a very, very valid treatment option for a lot of women. Um, and sometimes we're starting to use more, more plastic surgical techniques as another way of, um, of performing partial mastectomies on, on, other women, on, on more women with, with different benefits, really thinking about reduction techniques. When we think about mastectomy, that's obviously removing the whole breast. And there's a lot of different ways of doing it. And mostly that comes around whether or not you're going to be thinking about a reconstruction at the same time as surgery. A reconstruction doesn't have to be done at the same time as a cancer surgery. It can be done um, further down, down the track. Um, and, and there are lots of things that, that tie into that decision. Some women think about should they have one breast off or two. Um, generally my advice on this front is unless there's a very clear need and your doctor should be very, very um, aware of this and very clear with you, I think it's always useful to focus on treating the size that you know the cancer's in first. We can always come back and do preventative surgery on the other side if it's the right thing. Um, uh, but there are lots of things that, that can tie into that initial decision to want to think about having surgery on both sides. Um, when we talk about mastectomies, we throw around a lot of different words. Um, and some people might hear about skin sparing mastectomies, that's when we leave the skin behind for a reconstruction. And sometimes it can be appropriate to think about leaving the nipple behind as well. Um, and all of those approaches are designed to achieve the best cosmetic outcome, so the best appearance from a, um, from a breast perspective. So after you've made all of those decisions, planned what the, what's the right option for you and gone through, through that, the next time you tend to sit down and have a chat with your surgeon apart from when you're seeing them on the ward is the first appointment after for the results. And, and in that appointment we have a look at um, 
how things are healing um, and checking how you're recovering from the operation. And most of them find that they recover far better than they expect they're going to. And then we sit down and go through all the results, all the, what we call pathology. And with this, we go through the size, we go through the grade, we talk about the type of cancer. We look at something called lymphovascular space invasion, so that's whether or not there are any cancer cells in the blood vessels and lymphatics around the, around the tumour. We look at a whole variety of things called receptors, particularly the hormonal, the estrogen and progesterone receptors and a growth factor receptor called HER2. Um, it's got another name, CERB2 as well, just to confuse matters further. And then we look at whether or not there is any lymph node involvement, and if there is lymph node involvement, exactly how many they, there are and what size that might be. Um, these things are all really important because they're all different parts of the jigsaw puzzle that help us give you an accurate idea about what your long-term risk is going to be and what sort of benefits that you can get from different kinds of treatments. Um, sometimes I find there's quite a bit of confusion between stage and grade. The grade is often what you, you're told first and it's, um, there's only three of those and it's an indicator of, of how aggressive the individual cells are looking within the cancer. Um, whereas the stage is, is a more overall picture and it's based on something called the TNM classification and it puts together whether or not there are signs of spread around the rest of the body, whether or not there's lymph node involvement and the extent of that, and then features about predominantly the size of the cancer to help figure that out. So we've talked a little bit about women having partial mastectomies needing to have radiotherapy. Sometimes women, have, a woman having a mastectomy have a slightly higher chance of recurrence or, or problems with the cancer coming back in the, in the same breast or in the lymph nodes after a mastectomy. And in that situation, we will also recommend radiotherapy. And the reason is to reduce those chances of the cancer coming back. Um, generally, we think of traditional radiotherapy as being given five days a week for about five minutes a day for five weeks. Um, newer techniques are coming about to try and re reduce that burden, because obviously it's quite a significant inconvenience to be having to turn up somewhere every day for, for five weeks. Um, and hyperfractionated radiotherapy is giving the same radiotherapy over a shorter period of time, normally over three weeks. Uh, more recently, um, techniques called a partial breast um, irradiation have been developed uh, with intraocular radiotherapy being the more common approach. They're newer and I think they're certainly starting to find their place for, um, for a number of women as a potential option for um, radiotherapy from um, really only in the setting of a partial mastectomy. And the reason we're thinking about things like partial breast radiotherapy is that if you can do it in a shorter time and have the same effect and benefit, um, that might mean that more women can consider breast conservation if they, if they wish um, because of um, the minimising the impact it will have on the rest of the life. Um, and it's based on, on the fact that we know that if you do get something coming back in the same breast, most of them for most patients occur close to where the original cancer was. So maybe we don't need to treat the whole breast, maybe we can just treat that area. Um, and then obviously everyone is worried about chemotherapy. Um, when I talk about chemotherapy and seeing the medical oncologist, I'm actually thinking about chemotherapy, which is what we call cytotoxic chemotherapy, and that's what everyone thinks about in terms of standard chemotherapy. That's what can make you feel sick and can make your hair fall out. Um, but also for breast cancer, there are targeted treatments. Um, the, the commonest being um, endocrine treatments, so hormone blocking treatments like tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors, um, and targeted drug treatments like Herceptin and some of the newer drugs coming through. So we've obviously covered quite a bit and I'm going to leave it there um, and obviously hopefully people will have questions going forward. Great, thank you Elisa, that was fantastic. Our last speaker is Janice Wood, who worked with a breast care nurse at North Shore Hospital for some years and is now on staff part-time here at Breast Cancer Foundation in Yes. Janice, tell us what a breast care nurse does and maybe you could also share with us some of what you've learned from patients about how they get to... Sure. So I'm going to look at the next steps after diagnosis and um, looking at some of the challenges that people face of its tips and what supports out there. Um, and we just heard very eloquently from Mary about the um, emotional impact of a breast cancer diagnosis. 
and sort of the range of um, emotional um, you know, reactions that, are, that people experience, and they're all very normal, and you do have to give yourself time to, to process what's happened to you. But how to manage those emotions so that they don't absolutely overwhelm you. Um, obviously, fatigue makes stress and anxiety so much worse, so if you're not sleeping despite, despite taking normal measures, it's perfectly reasonable to go along and talk to your GP about perhaps getting some low-dose, short-term night sedation, just to break that cycle and to um, and, and just get you back on track again and, and you're able to deal a little bit better with what's happening. It's perfectly fine in the long term, it's just it's not good to use it in the longer term and, and get to rely on it. If you've got someone that you confide in, that you can confide in, that's that's going to be absolute gold. And as Mary said, that can be difficult because you tell somebody that you've been diagnosed and, and often, although they're well meaning, it can also be to make them feel better, they'll say, Oh, I just know you're going to be fine which is well meaning, but it immediately denies you the opportunity to talk about how you're feeling. So if you're struggling to find someone to talk to, consider having even just one or two sessions with a health psychologist um, because they, they're not emotionally involved with you. You can tell them anything and they'll give you some coping strategies and your breast scanners can, can refer you to, to a health psychologist. Somewhere in your day, if you can, just try and find yourself a calm space. It doesn't have to be a physical space. You can put some headphones on, listen to some calming music. You can go for a walk in the park or something. Um, yoga, meditation, mindfulness, they're all really helpful. And it just quells some of those um, thoughts in your head, really. And also, look at your schedule. You can't do everything when, you, when you're dealing with this. So declutter your schedule. Um, prioritize with yourself at the head of the priority list. And, um, um, and delegate, get rid of some of these things. And Alisa mentioned that it's, it's okay to take time to, to make some of these treatment decisions. You don't have to be diagnosed and then operated on in the same week. It's, it's actually important to take a little bit of time, talk to whoever you need to talk to. It might be a GP, it might be family members. You might want to go and get a second opinion. But it's important that you're on board with, with the treatment plan and it's right for you. Don't forget that nothing happens without your consent. Um, you've, you've got to, it's got to be right for you. And in all of this, you'll meet a lot of people, a lot of medical specialists, so it's important to know who does what. But um, even more importantly, who, who's your go-to person? Who do you contact between appointments for each of the medical teams? And, and make your breast care nurse your key worker. I can't stress enough <laughs> the importance of the role of the breast care nurse. She will be your go-to person. Her role is to inform and educate you and your family um, and to support you, to advocate for you and to refer you on to other services as you need them. If you haven't got access to a breast care nurse, and, and there are still some areas in the country where there is not a breast care nurse, we do have one at the foundation, so you can ring, uh, you can ring our nurse on 0800 BC Nurse, and we'll put those contacts up again later. Uh, Monday to Friday, she's here to, to help ask your questions. And it is a time of information overload. You're being asked to, to, to cope with all these new medical terms, things that you never wanted to know about. Uh, and the temptation really is to, um, to rest home and uh, ask Dr. Google. But particularly in the early stages, try not to do that. Rather, go back to your medical team and ask and ask again. They're happy to answer your questions. And, um, you, you, it's often difficult to contact your specialist, but you can certainly uh, find your breast care nurse between consultations and she will probably answer your questions and if not, she'll find out for you and get back to you. And try not to race ahead in your information search. Stick to what you know. There's so much variability in this disease, plus you're an individual person and your treatment plan is very individual. So stick to what you know, then ask your specialist team for reliable websites that you can. Um, and we talked about the importance of bringing someone else to appointments. Also, ask for copies of all your, your results. It's your information, and, and they will give it to you. Um, and copies of clinic letters. It helps you keep, um, keep tabs on what's happening, when things should happen, and gives you some, all of a sudden, keep tabs on what's happening, when things should happen, and gives you some, all of this information. This gives you a better sense of control at a time when almost everything seems, seems otherwise out of control. Who and when to tell, um, well Mary talked about 
that being a difficult thing and, and uh, having someone as a gatekeeper to disseminate that information is really, really helpful so you don't have to keep repeating it. And putting a message, an answer phone message on your phone is always a good thing too because then you can choose if and when to ring people back. I went to a seminar some time ago with a health psychologist who talked about um, being able to identify your A, your B and your C support teams and I thought it was quite good advice. So your A team are the people that you can tell anything to. No detail, too lurid, they're there for you thick and thin, they're your A team. Your B team, not so much on the details, but they really want to help with the practical stuff. So they'll go and pick up the kids, they'll do your shopping, all that sort of thing. So you know um, who they are and what they what they want to do. Your C team, they're more the run for the hills. <laughs> like, don't go there. But that doesn't mean to say they don't want to help and that and that they can't help you. So on the days when you just want to have a day when you you want to feel normal, um, they're the people to go out and have a coffee with, go to a movie with, and you can almost guarantee that the words breast cancer won't come up in the conversation so <laughs> you can have a bit of a day off. Um, talking with, with children, that's obviously a, a huge hurdle to get over. And the temptation is to try and shield them, but it's actually not a good idea. They very quickly sense something's gone wrong in the family, and they might be imagining something even worse. So it's just a matter of um, honesty and some reassurance for them, particularly young children, um, and trying to keep some routines in place so that they feel secure. And use age-appropriate language. Older children, teenagers, they'll have more awareness of cancer from hearing stories at school and things, so, and perhaps more fears around it. And their, their reactions might seem a bit inappropriate to you at times. They might be embarrassed, they might be angry, um, they might totally refuse to, to talk about it and they'll, they'll each deal with it in their own way. Um, and for that, it's, it's important to think about where those reactions might be coming from, and particularly with, with teenagers. Or they may actually feel that they've been in some way to blame for this. So try and communicate with school as well. It's sometimes good to let the teachers know that this is happening in the family so they can, they can just give the kids a bit of leeway and they can also inform you if there's any behaviour which is a bit concerning. The Cancer Society have a really good booklet, the Cancer in the Family, and the Breast Cancer Foundation can also um, supply a book which is for younger children in comic form and it's called Medikids and both of these books are, are supplied free. Of course, breast cancer diagnosis drops in on the rest of your life. It doesn't happen in isolation. So there's, you know, there's family commitments, there's study, there's financial commitments, and of course there's work. So how do you how do you manage work? Well, your surgeon will advise you how you know what's the appropriate or the most likely amount of time you'll need off surgery to recover, and your oncologist will advise if you're going to be having chemotherapy, a whether it's wise to continue in your job during um, during treatment. Um, or B, whether it's, you know, you perfectly well be able to get by hopefully with just some time off after each cycle and then go back to work after that. Uh, work can be a good distraction if you can manage it. So talk to your manager, discuss your leave entitlements. See if there's any flexibility about your, um, about your, uh, your work needs. Um, can you work from home? Can you go part time? Are there any flexibility with deadlines? And don't forget to factor in the fact that we'll factor in the fact there will be some some fatigue going along with these treatments. So particularly with radiotherapy, most women um, tend to be able to work through radiotherapy, but um, as the treatment progresses, they'll often experience a bit more fatigue towards the end. And you have to remember that the fatigue, because of the um, cumulative effect, that the fatigue carries on for a bit longer after the treatment ends and before it tails off. And there's also chemo brain, which can, can also occur with hormone therapy. So that's your um, difficulties with concentration, with short term memory. And it's important that people know that this is a this is a, a treatment effect. It's not you losing it, it's, it's caused by your treatment and uh, and will lessen after treatment is finished. And your GP can help with medical certificates if you're needing to apply to WINS or anything. Um, your GP's better place to do that rather than asking your specialist to do it because they, they know more about the background information. So, so some practical tips before you go into surgery is to, um, to look around and get yourself some soft, non-underwire bras. You might want to wear them at night too if you've had a partial mastectomy. 
but you don't want to be having anything that's going to dig into you. So camisole, food tubes, they're, they're great also for popping a little soft cloth pieces if you've had a mastectomy. And it avoids pressure on the wound. You want loose front opening tops, so you don't want to be having to raise your arms to get in and out of the dress. Pajamas are ideal for the same reason. And a shawl is good. Get yourself a shawl because you can drape it around yourself. It means that if you've got drains, people can't see them. If you've had a mastectomy and you're not comfortable enough to wear your little soft cloth pieces, um, nobody can see. And there's lovely silky cushions that um, feel so wonderful under your arm when you've had auxiliary surgery. They, they'll probably be provided by your breast care nurse. If not, you can get them through the foundation or from the Cancer Society. And put some relaxing music on your iPod or your phone. Take that into hospital with you. And at home, particularly if you're going to be on, on your own for some time while you're recovering, just look around and see what are the things that you're going to need to use and just make sure that they're down on a low level because you don't want to be, again, with your after auxiliary surgery or with um, a tender wound, so um, lifting up and trying to get things down from a high level. And go to the $2 shop and get yourself one of those little lanyards with a clip on the end because when you get into the shower, you can clip the drains on and then you've got both hands free. In the same way, Take a sipper bottle into, into hospital because it's easier than reaching over and trying to pour water from a jug into a, into a glass. And be prepared to do your post-op exercises. Know about them beforehand so that you know when to do them and what your limitations are because it's so important to avoid any problems with mobility afterwards. And on the whole, just give yourself permission to rest. Don't try and be Superman or Superwoman because Rest is so healing, both physically and emotionally. It's really important to take your medications as, as prescribed, um, particularly to control side effects such as nausea. It's so much easier to be preventing rather than coming from behind. And um, also the little tips like eating little and often rather than big meals can be really helpful with, um, with nausea. The best things to take to a chemo appointment with you, music, books, an iPad, a warm shawl, and a supportive friend. And remember that a little bit of exercise can work wonders, can reduce fatigue and, um, and just make you feel better. And in terms of well-being, don't forget the Look Good, Feel Better seminars, they're absolutely wonderful. And it's a good idea to make a treatment calendar, so you can tick off um, when your chemo cycles are, and after every cycle, Slot on, a, slot on a treat. It's, it's really nice. It helps. It, it, it helps you, you know, put things behind you and and gives you gives you a little reward for it. But important, it's important to keep your medical team informed about your side effects. Don't suffer in silence at home because what you're experiencing, you might think you have to put up with it because it's on your list of side effects, but it might actually be well in excess of what the what the specialist would want you to be experiencing and they could help you with it if they know about it. And at every step, just reassess your support needs so that um, if you declined a counselling referral, referral or earlier in the piece, it doesn't matter that, uh, it doesn't mean that you can't go back and, um, and access it again. Because often it's at the very end of treatment um, that people feel that they, only then do they realise the, you know, the, the actual reality of what's happened to them. And that's the time when, when they can do with extra support or they might want, might want to access a support group. So there is lots of good information out there, good reliable information and lots of support. So we really do encourage you to, to take advantage of it. And the next three slides which, um, which we'll put up just show you some examples of some really reliable information and support networks that are out there. Great, thank you Janice, and thanks to all three of you. We're now going to open up to some questions from you guys at home. You can type questions in the box at the bottom left of the screen, and we'll get through as many as we can in the time available. And Lisa, would you mind pushing that microphone up to the middle, and so I'll, I'll just sum the questions out. Um, so one question that we have already, um, Janice, you were talking about not not being shy about talking about side effects, and maybe Alicia, you can help with this. 
Uh, we have someone who says, I had a, a, who had a hook wire guided wide local excision eight weeks ago and has constant pain. Is there a solution for this beyond panadine, gabapentin and tramadol? I think if they've got constant pain in eight weeks with that, they probably need to be popping it into the surgeon. Right. Mm, that does seem like quite a long time to do. Normally by six weeks you can, you can be comfortable, so I think that does need to be an investigation. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's anything sinister no. going on, but that is outside what I would normally expect. So I think it's important to get checked out to make sure that there's no um, what we call hematoma, so no big bruises that need to be dealt with, that there's no signs of infection. And I think if you're having quite significant pain at that point, that for me can be one of the indicators that we might need to be looking at getting some pain specialists involved early on in the piece. Um, now, some of us, why is chemotherapy sometimes done ahead of surgery for some people, Elisa? <laughs> um, so, chemotherapy. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. So, so, chemotherapy before surgery is what we call neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And there's a whole lot of different reasons to do it. Now, sometimes the type of cancer that you have um, mandates it. So, the common one for that, for that is what we call an inflammatory cancer. Um, and that's a cancer where there's a lot of um, redness of the skin, which can be a feature of how the cancer is developing in the breast. And that's a sort of situation where it's actually not technically possible, and certainly not the best thing to do surgery first, because you really want to shrink things down before you look at doing an operation. And we've been giving chemotherapy in that setting for a long time. But we started to look at giving what we call neoadjuvant chemotherapy um, for a whole lot of different reasons. One of the reasons I think about it, and it typically is for HER2 positive cancers or triple negative, so ones that are estrogen, progesterone and HER2 negative on biopsy. Um, and the reason for that is those are cancers that are shown to be particularly responsive to chemotherapy, so your expectation is going to be that you're going to get the most benefit. And so sometimes, uh, well, one of the benefits of giving chemotherapy first is that you can see how the cancer is going to respond. Um, and so sometimes you can have a situation where by the time the chemotherapy is finished and you go to do the operation, that there's no living cancer cells left in the breast tissue. And that's what we call a complete pathological response. Um, and in that situation, as specialists, we can be much more positive for women in terms of their outlook because of the way that we've seen that the cancers responded to treatment. Sometimes there's a whole lot of things going on, particularly for our younger women. Um, and we might want to get the advice from genetics and work out about some of the BRCA1 and BRCA2 testing that might impact on a woman's decision about what kind of surgery they're going to have. And by giving the chemotherapy first, you give yourself a little bit of time to figure out that information to help decision making. Um, and sometimes it also gives you time to coordinate the kind of surgery you're doing, particularly when you're thinking about doing immediate reconstruction. So there can be a benefit of getting the treatment and getting the chemotherapy um, out of the way, and that also gives you time to coordinate the different specialists that you need from a reconstructive perspective. And certainly if you're think, thinking about some of the bigger reconstructions, what we call the autologous reconstructions, where you're moving bits of tissue around from one part of the body to the other, they're much bigger operations to recover from than a straightforward mastectomy. And it's quite nice to be doing that after you've had the chemotherapy rather than while you're having the chemotherapy. Sometimes you can change the situation from um, a woman who has to have a mastectomy to start with. Occasionally you can convert it to a situation where you may now be able to do a partial mastectomy when you haven't thought you could beforehand. Um, and I think there is also a role from a trial perspective in terms of developing new drugs in terms of looking, chemo looking at giving chemotherapy first. Um, and I think uh, the, the neoadjuvant space is really advancing with greatly um, uh, in New Zealand. Great. Thank you, Elisa. Um, a question now from someone who has asked, how soon after a lumpectomy can you do um, active exercise like swimming or gym? Um, so, yeah, it, well, it, yeah, it depends on the patient. I mean, I think 
Certainly things like swimming, I don't like my patients to swim for at least two weeks after an operation because I want the wound to be nicely healed. And so I think it's pretty fair to say that you, you should probably avoid gym exercise um, in, in swimming until you've seen your surgeon for the first, for the first um, post-op visit and that you've got the sign off that the wound, things are healing well and that it's safe to be swimming in, in pool, um, from an infection perspective. And then it's about seeing how you feel at that time. I mean, the breasts are on the outside of the body, so they're actually quite separate from all those muscles and things, and some women will feel very comfortable going back to the gym and even doing quite a lot of upper body work at two weeks. Other women, it can take two months or longer. Um, I think one of the things that, re and it's about listening to your body um, and figuring out what works for you. You're certainly not going to do any harm from any of those activities. Um, you just might make yourself feel a little bit more uncomfortable. I think how quickly you can get back to certainly gym exercises um, does depend a little bit on the kind of surgery you've needed on your armpit from the lymph node biopsy perspective. I think it's pretty fair to say that a woman who's needed to have more lymph nodes involved in axillary detection is going to take a little bit longer. Did you find that, Karen? Yeah, I, I went straight back to the gym after two weeks, but I restricted what I was doing, so I didn't lift weight. Um, I didn't do any of the boxing. Which <laughs> 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 was strange, really. But I did, um, I still walked a lot, and so I was keeping active, and that was really important to me. And I, I felt that I needed to keep physically strong and healthy. And um, I think it was more, I found it more of a struggle after the um, radiotherapy to keep going. Um, but I did. I, I still continue to go to the gym, but we, 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 as I said before, we changed what we were doing. And so it might be yoga and more stretching. And I think having my gym lady as well as my physio really helped mm -hmm. because they, I, I was able to talk to both of them. So we worked out what was the best exercises. Because the one thing that I found was I had a lot of cording mm -hmm. in my armpit. Mm -hmm. And it actually ran from just below my left what was my breast, <laughs> right down to below my elbow, wow. and yeah, it was uncomfortable. very uncomfortable. And um, that she was great at stretching all that out and breaking it all down, but having the extra stretches at the gym helped too. And because of all those variables, that's why they, you know, they often don't give hard and fast rules about that mm. anymore. It's more about what's right for you and, and, and your comfort, comfort yeah. level. Yeah. I think it's probably pretty fair to say that even if you're feeling really good, it's probably a good idea to go back to something modified and don't try and do your full gym routine first mm -hmm. up. Yeah. yeah. A question for Janice. Um, when is a breast care nurse provided to you? I've had the mastectomy, but this is the first time hearing about the breast care nurse. Janice, could you just lean in this mm -hmm. way a bit? Yeah. Um, well, that's, that's I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> but it is, uh, the reality is that there are some areas in the country where a breast care nurse is not available, but um, but ideally a breast care nurse would see you at diagnosis and uh, be able to talk to you afterwards and, and help explain uh, what's being said, and then would be with you um, as a, a person to access right through the whole treatment trajectory, really. So, um, and as I said, for people who don't have access to a breast care nurse, we do have a breast care nurse at the foundation, so feel free to to give Sarah a call on 0800 BC News, or you can email her, and the, um, we've, we've already put those contact details up. But it does help enormously to have a breast care nurse on board with you, so um, I, would, I would really encourage you to. But also ask, ask your, um, your surgeon or at, at the hospital or clinic, um, is there a breast care nurse that you perhaps should have seen, um, and um, get those contact details. And Sarah, our nurse, can tell you who the nurses are mm. in your area. That's right. They're there as well. Yeah. Great. Um, question, um, if you have a partial mastectomy followed by chemo and radiation and then the cancer come back, comes back, Alisa, you said that you can't do the same thing again. So what do you do? Um, I think it, I mean, it depends on where the cancer comes back. So when I think about cancer coming back, which is quite a broad term, um, uh, cancer can come back in terms of spread around the rest of the body, and that's a very different situation to the cancer coming back in the breast or in the lymph node, so what we call loco-regional occurrence. And sometimes you can even develop a new cancer within the breast. Um, 
if you have a recurrence in the breast, um, you're committed to looking at doing a mastectomy in that situation, but you can still look at doing a reconstruction in that setting. Um, if there is further um, disease in the lymph nodes, certainly if there's a lymph node under the arm, um, you can certainly do surgery in that situation, but you tend to need to have radiotherapy after that if you haven't already. Um, and then if there's the sign of, of spread around the rest of the body, that is generally dealt with by the medical oncologist with some of the drugs as a control of that situation. But sometimes there can be um, a role for surgery um, in, in a whole variety of settings, but that's a um, and I knew that that's a, a much um, less common scenario, and it's something we 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 work in something called multidisciplinary teams, which is where all your specialists sit down and talk about cases together and do scans and come up with plans. So um, if you have a recurrence, that's the sort of situation where we we're making those decisions and recommendations for our patients. Now, a question about mammograms after surgery. Um, if your mammogram falls due before that 12 month post surgery period, when should you go ahead with it? Would it be too soon, six months after your surgery, to have a mammogram? It depends on what kind of surgery you've had. Um, generally speaking, I tend to um, try and keep the mammography happening at the anniversary date. Um, it would be pretty unusual to have had a mammogram, uh, have to have had a partial mastectomy six months after mm. your mammogram. Um, that may be because you've had an eovaginal approach, and there might be a whole lot of different reasons. Um, but you, we, I wouldn't routinely do a mammogram of a mastectomy in a reconstructed breast, and I think most people wouldn't look at doing a mammogram of that side. So, if you've had a mastectomy on one side and your anniversary for the other side is at six months, it's entirely appropriate. If it's something like neoadjuvant chemotherapy that's that's tied into why the surgeries happened six months after. Um, the initial mammogram, I tend to leave it a little bit longer, um, potentially not out to a year, um, and, and the surgeon should be able to guide you with that. Great. Um, so after radiation therapy? Um, yeah, I think I would, I certainly, if you, that's a very good point, Janice, I think um, no woman will thank you for doing a mammogram mm -hmm. very soon after radiotherapy, and in fact, I would leave it for six months after radiotherapy. Because not only is it going to be uncomfortable for, for a time, and we know that the discomfort and changes in the breast continue to happen for quite some weeks to months after the radiotherapy treat, the treatment has stopped, but also you want to give time for the new normal. So it's helpful for us to not have all those changes that you see with the radiotherapy and to give us a chance for that to settle so we can get more accurate information from the mammogram. And still on the same subject, if someone has a an odd twinge in the breast that was operated on for a lumpectomy six months after surgery, should they be getting that looked at? Um, I think it's probably worthwhile getting it checked out to address your concern. Having said that, and really for reassurance, having said that, a lot of patients will have twinges at six months after a partial mastectomy. Um, often the scars on the breast are pretty, pretty minimal. Um, but what we've done to the breast inside surgically is a lot. If you've had a partial mastectomy, you've had radiotherapy, and it may well be that your treatment, including you know all of the treatment, because when you think of, when I think about partial mastectomies and treating breast cancer, it's not just the surgical component. That partial mastectomies and treating breast cancer, it's not just the surgical component. That whole treatment package includes the radiotherapy, and those changes take time to settle. And we do know that, that a lot of women can have ongoing pain for quite some time afterwards. So um, I see a lot of my patients who come to see me at six months and are concerned because they're having twinges and, and discomfort. Um, and often that can be things like the nerves growing back and it's very normal. But if it's causing anxiety, the easiest thing to do is to get it checked out and get reassurance. Great, thank you. Um, Janice, are all patients reviewed by a multidisciplinary? Yes, they are. All, all cases of cancer, um, they're usually, usually discussed both preoperatively and certainly postoperatively, certainly postoperatively with results. 
Um, and if anything else should happen along the way, it will get discussed again. So it is a multidisciplinary approach. And in the meeting, everybody who was involved um, reviews. So the, the mammograms and any images get put up for review by the whole team. Um, the surgeon will describe the operation and um, and and why why that operation was chosen. Um, the pathologist will will discuss the the results uh, from the specimen, and then the medical and radiation oncologist will make a recommendation as to treatment. So it is a it is a consensus decision. It's not one person making it. Um, and this is a decision for you in isolation. Great. Now, a question about a um, pathology um, report. What does um, estrogen receptor posit positive 90% 3 plus mean? <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> That's a good thing. So, um, we, when I started training in terms of re surgery, the, the pathologist used to just say positive or negative. But now we, we know that. Um, it's not an on-off switch, and not all cells throughout a cancer are uniform. So we get a positive or negative, and then the the percentage is the proportion of breast cancer cells that are positive. And then when the pathologists are looking at it under the microscope, they do stains called immunohistochemistry, which basically are brown. And the three plus is how brown it is. Um, and three plus is very brown. And what that means is that this particular cancer is strongly estrogen receptor positive. And the oncologists like that because it means their endocrine treatments, so things like tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors like Arimidex um, or Letrozole are going to be very effective or expected to be effect very effective. Right. Now I'm just checking the questions we've got lined up. There are a few and we're quite short on time, so we might just run some quick answers through <laughs> some of these questions. Um, okay. If um, diagnosed with invasive lobular cancer, a low grade nuclei, ER3 positive, ER2 positive, will I get a choice between chemo or removal? Yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> this so ERPR positive. Yep. And lobular. And lobular. And lobular. Yeah. Yeah. Three. 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 Do an MRI. That's a complex discussion. That's discussion, and you should ask your surgeon. Um, I think it's the best thing. Okay. Um, I had a mastectomy with removal of eleven lymph nodes. I have considerable discomfort, tingling sensations across my chest, down the arm, presumably from nerve endings. How long will this continue? <laughs> um, that it can be very variable. Um, some people's symptoms recover very quickly. Sometimes it can last a few months. Okay, what are the treatment options for triple negative breast cancer? What chemo is available? Um, so when you're talking about a triple negative um, cancer, you're talking about cytotoxic chemotherapy predominantly. Um, generally speaking, um, the most of the time the oncologists are talking about something called FEC and taxane based chemotherapy. So cyclophosphamide and the new machine, radiotherapy machine mentioned on the news in the last couple of days in Australia as a clinical trial, is that available in New Zealand? Um, what is it? <laughs> no, there's, that's part of partial breast radiotherapy and there are lots of different techniques and technologies to give partial breast radiotherapy. Sometimes it can be what we call 3D conformal, which is using standard radiotherapy machines, but using the CT, the CT scans to plan where the dose is given. Um, a type called brachytherapy, and then the the one that's available in New Zealand is um, um, intraoperative radiotherapy with a machine called Intrabeam. Um, but radiotherapy has different types protons and electrons and my understanding of the trial that's being run in Australia is that it's an electron um, based brachytherapy, so given during an operation. It's not a machine that's available in New Zealand but from what I can gather um, the, the trials are very early in terms of um, that particular technology but there are different technologies 
to do the same thing, one of which is available in New Zealand. Great, thank you. Okay, so well done guys, that brings us right up to our 8 o'clock deadline. So thank you very much for joining us tonight and thanks again to Mary and Elisa and Janice. We hope you found this helpful um, and we'd appreciate if you could take the time to give us your feedback as you exit the webinar. If tonight's discussion has raised any questions or concerns, our breast care nurse Sarah is available right now, the number's on your screen. You can give her a call until 9 o'clock tonight or tomorrow you can call our 0800 CC nurse line. As well as answering questions, our nurses can provide referrals to free counselling and funded rehabilitation and can also tell you a bit about our MyBC online community. In the next few days, we'll send you a link to the recording of this webinar if you'd like to watch it again or recommend it to someone else. Thanks again for joining us and good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.